Whoa, okay, that is a, a pickaxe? It, Kristen? Uh, wow! Oh, crap. Last we saw her, she was taking a pickaxe, and now she has blood on her leg. And then we have Kristen in David's vision. She's going towards the demon goat man. And now we're hearing that Orson was actually bludgeoned to death. <gasps> it burned her. So the crucifix burned her. Kristen is possessed. This is a lot to process, but that bombshell had my jaw on the ground. We're gonna go back and start from the beginning of the episode and break it down for you guys, okay? What's up, everybody? I am talking about the evil episode 13 finale, and boy, they dropped a bombshell on us. I don't know if you guys were ready for that, but I did not see that coming at all. If there are signs or if there were signs along the way that we missed to pay attention to because they implied that Kristen is possessed or could potentially be possessed, are there signs that we missed all along the way that we just didn't pay attention to? If she is possessed, we don't know how long she's been possessed. We don't know how she became possessed. Was it something that she picked up in one of these cases? So there are a lot of questions that are unanswered, but we do have some answers. I know I said that I would be doing a puzzle video and I do plan on doing that. And I also plan on doing a video about these numbers. As we can see, every episode other than the pilot, I think, has some type of number and these are supposed to add up to something. And I haven't come across anyone who has figured this out yet. So if you have any clue or if you have solved this equation, but I'd like to take a separate video and devote it to this and to the puzzle pieces as well. So in this video, I'm going to be mostly recapping episode 13 in the finale and what happened. There are a lot of unanswered questions. If you would like to have some answers or a little bit more insight from the producers themselves, I recommend going to the Instagram page. This is what I have right here. If you look on the evil Instagram page, it actually completes a picture. Starting at the bottom here, it goes through and has little videos where you have the kings kind of breaking down and talking and giving their own insight to each episode. We got a lot to cover. Without further ado, let's get right into the episode. The episode starts off with what looks like a flashback to when Kristen was questioning Orson and doing a psych evaluation on him. This scene looks familiar because it was in the very, very first episode. As we know from the last episode, Orson is now a free man because the judge overturned all of his convictions. So he is completely free and out in this world. Everything looks the same from what we remember when the scene happened the first time around, except one thing is different. When Kristen looks at her phone, she can't see the numbers. This is a good way to determine whether you're dreaming or not. If you cannot see the numbers, that indicates that you are dreaming, that this is not real. So we have a close up on the phone and you can tell we can't see the numbers. And I think Kristen realizes this is a dream. And as you remember, she drew the cross on the table. So we see this happen again and she begins to recite the Lord's Prayer. But this time as she recites it, you see her grab or something and this is not what happened. That is not what happened. When this scene happened before, Orson lunged at her and she was visibly shaken. But here, she's just completely attacking him. And this is a dream. So I figure, oh, okay, well, Kristen is just having a fantasy where she actually did something that maybe she wished she had done when she had the chance. You have those all the time. You're like, hey, I wish I had told that person off. But watching this again for the second time, knowing what we learned at the end of the episode, I'm thinking this is more foreshadowing. But the dream isn't done yet. She wakes up and look who's at the end of the bed. It's George. But something's different this time. She actually has scissors under her pillow. So first she attacks Orson and now it looks like she's about to attack George. And she stabs him in the back with the scissors. Ow. She kills George. But it's still not over yet. There is a knock on the door. What's behind door number three? She goes outside the hallway and we see our goat man. The same goat man that we saw appear as Leland's therapist in the end of the last episode. So this demon goat man has now appeared to both Leland and Kristen. And he's actually giving her a slow clap for killing George. He says, your husband gave you a gift and you didn't even take it. Go climb your mountain. When Kristen asks, how does he even know about that? He says, you know how. This doesn't sit well with Kristen. She looks horrified. And then she wakes up. And she's in bed. She was having a nightmare. So Lexus is awake and she tells Kristen that she saw it too. And then, disturbingly enough, blood pours out of her mouth. This is more foreshadowing because what we learn later about the fertility clinic that she went to, it all kind of makes sense right now and falls into place. So Kristen wakes up again. So this is kind of like Inception where you're inside a dream, inside a dream, inside a dream, inside a dream. Like how many different layers 
Well, for now, this looks like the final one. We're then taken to a scene where Kristen is looking at the gift that Andy gave her, saying it's your turn to go climb the mountain, which we know she decided she didn't want to do. We learn that Andy has gone to Denver. He's not going to go on the tour. He's just setting it up. But he is currently out of town at the moment. So the girls want to know if Grandma is going to be babysitting, and Kristen is asking them if she's been acting different lately. I think Kristen is on to the fact that she's still probably seeing Leland. So she tries to get this information from the girls to find out whether or not Grandma broke up with Leland or not. Unfortunately, the girls don't seem to know. Before the girls leave to go to the bus, Alexis tells Kristen, don't worry, it won't hurt you. Kristen asks her, what is she talking about? She says, your nightmare. So apparently Kristen told Alexis about her nightmare, but she doesn't recall telling her about the nightmare. Yeah, so we don't really know what's real and what isn't real, or at least Kristen doesn't. When the girls go to get on the bus, Kristen realizes she has an unwanted visitor waiting behind the bus. Orson is here. Orson wants to bury the hatchet, so to speak. Yeah, so this is not gonna go over well with Kristen. Kristen immediately calls police, tells them that there is a gentleman near the schoolgirls touching himself. Orson keeps insisting that he's only there to make peace. He wants to be friends. He wants her forgiveness. Orson tells Kristen he found God and that you reap what you sow. So finally he leaves. We're then taken to a scene with Kristen's therapist, as we know, Dr. Boggs. He has called in Kristen, David, and Ben because he has a patient that insists she wants to have an exorcism. Dr. Boggs is a skeptic. He doesn't really believe in this stuff, but he's seen results when the patients actually believe in it, it might actually help heal them. So if the patient believes in the results of the exorcism, I guess it kind of works as a placebo effect. Meanwhile, Kristen wants to know why are all these exorcisms women? So this is the patient, this is Eleanor. She's eight and a half months along and expecting twins. Eleanor Eleanor doesn't think she's possessed. She thinks her fetus is possessed. Notice I say fetus, not fetuses. She's expecting one boy and one girl, and she believes the boy is possessed. She also conceived these children through in vitro fertilization. She hears a lot of bad noises. It sounds like bats coming from one of her fetuses while she's hearing the other fetus cry. This is pretty creepy, I gotta tell you. After meeting with the patient, the four of them talk outside the office, and Kristen suggests maybe she's having some type of prenatal psychosis. But Dr. Bach says there's not a lot of time to work out a treatment plan for that because the woman is actually due in 10 days. But after they leave the office, the camera pans away to, I think it looks like Dr. Boggs' assistant, and she's on the phone with Leland, and Leland is asking her who's in the office. Yeah, so she reports that the three of them are there, plus this patient with the demonic baby fetus. Back at the house, Kristen confronts Cheryl and demands to know if she's still dating Leland. She figured out there were only three people that knew about the gift that Andy gave her. Cheryl, Kristen, and Andy. Kristen has had it. She does not want her mom involved with their family at all if she's dating Leland, so she tells her she needs to make a choice. Leland or seeing her family. And her answer is bye. When she goes to leave, who's at the door? Mira. As we know from the last episode, Kristen brought up in court that Mira was writing a book and that made it case for her potentially wanting to pin all of the murders that Orson committed on Dwight so that she would have a little bit more content for her book, I guess. And based on what we saw, this didn't sit very well with Mira. So when Mira comes in, Kristen apologizes about what happened in court, but that's not what this is about. They have an assault complaint against Kristen. Now, when I first heard this, I thought it was Leland that actually filed an assault complaint because technically she did assault Leland with the knife, like she cut his throat. That's a legitimate assault complaint. But it wasn't Leland, it was actually Orson who filed a fake assault complaint claiming that Kristen accosted him. Kristen's laughing about this because it is ridiculous. She didn't even lay a hand on him. He was in front of her house on her property watching her girls. Mira tells Kristen she convinced him not to press charges. I don't know what you guys think, but I feel like Mira is holding a serious grudge and is kind of really reaching here. She has the nerve to tell Kristen to stay away from him when he's stalking her right outside her house. I'm not an expert on New York stalking laws, but I'm pretty sure appearing at someone's house when they don't want you there falls under that category. Well, this is interrupted because Kristen gets a text saying, Eleanor, hysterical, come quick. Eleanor is freaking out because she says it feels like the baby is eating her. So David does the crucifix test. She asks Eleanor to hold the crucifix in her hand. It doesn't burn her hand, so this would indicate that she is not possessed. So she places it on her belly, and that happens. Ah! Oh. It's the devil inside me. Okay. We're then taken to a scene in Leland's office and he appears to be looking at the map of the sigils that Kristen put together. Now, how did he get a hold of that? Cheryl. Cheryl gave it to him. 
Once again, this has been pointed out several times, but this is definitely one of David's father's painting on the wall here. And then he asked for Cheryl's key. We see him take a key off, but he tells Cheryl that he was trying to put his own key on it. And then the door buzzer rings, he goes outside, and he throws a key to somebody. Who does he throw it to? Oh, it's Orson. He tells Orson to make a copy of the key so that he'll have a key to Kristen's house. In case any of you might have been buying Orson's act of being a nice guy now, just take a look at that. He definitely doesn't have good intentions for that key. Kristen, Ben, and David have gone to the father to request an exorcism for the pregnant woman's fetus. Basically, he tells them he can't perform an exorcism because the fetus hasn't been born yet and doesn't have the ability to choose. Ben argues that maybe they can exercise the womb in the case of which there might be an infestation. Meanwhile, Kristen gets a call on her phone. It's Orson. He wants to call to apologize. He's Christian now. He wants to make amends. While he's on the phone, he's telling her he wants to apologize for everything that he's done to her. Kristen signals for Ben to come over. So Christian's trying to get Ben to figure out how to record all of this. Meanwhile, Orson is telling Kristen he's very sorry for fantasizing about snapping the heads of her daughters. Ben pulls out his phone and is able to get a little bit of what Orson Orson is saying, but I think he missed most of the important stuff. Everything here would indicate that Orson has no intention on letting up on trying to harass and antagonize Christian. So she has Ben change the locks on the door and put in a few security measures to the house. We're taken to a scene with Ben, Kristen, and David inside of Mass. The father wants to conduct a test during Mass before performing an exorcism on Eleanor. We see her taking communion here, and this happens. Oh gosh. Okay, this is the monitor for her sonogram, and as you can see, there is only one fetus now. The other fetus is gone. These look like devil's horns. Doctors claim that this is a parasitic twin. There's something called vanishing twin syndrome. It's when one of the fetuses is expired and then absorbed by the other one. But the good news is the remaining child is healthy and strong. Well, this is very comforting to Eleanor because that's the demon child. Meanwhile, back at the Shard house, Kristen has given girls each a copy of the new keys. She's also hiring a babysitter. So then she goes to give each of them a kiss and then look who's bleeding at the mouth. Alexis? She claims she brushed her teeth too hard. Meanwhile, they're going to go ahead and perform an exorcism on Eleanor's unborn fetus. We're then taken to a scene with Leland and Cheryl. It looks like they're out on a date in a restaurant. Cheryl tells Leland about the ultimatum that Kristen laid down to make her choose between Leland and the girls and her. And what do we have here? It's a box. Holy crap, Leland is going to propose. Oh my God, down on one knee and everything. The whole nine yards. Well, this is going to make a very awkward Thanksgiving, having... Leland be your stepfather? And Cheryl is smitten. And Leland is extremely happy about this. We're taken to a scene with Kristen and David. David tells Kristen about a Shakespeare verse. The line is actually from Henry the Fourth. Prince Henry says the line, when that this body did contain a spirit, a kingdom for it was too small a bound. David draws a parallel between that passage and the loss of a friend during a battle overseas. And David confides in Kristen that he basically fears death, which is something surprising for a religious man because Christians believe that there is an afterlife. And as you can see, there's a little bit of a shippy moment happening here. A friendshipy moment, but maybe a little bit slightly more than friendship. I don't know. I'll let you guys decide on that. We're taken to a scene back at the Bouchard house, and it sounds like someone is trying to get in the door. They're clearly trying to unlock the door, but can't unlock it, so then the doorbell rings a couple times, and Alexis wakes up. She goes downstairs, and she says hello, and you hear a voice that says, let me in. He says, let me in. I have an old key. When she asks, why should he let him in? He says, you know why. Well, we don't know why, so I'd like to know why. She opens the door, and yes, it is our Goatman demon from Narnia. Guys, this is the third person to see this image, this thing. Leland has seen it, Kristen has seen it, and now Alexis has seen it. He tells Alexis, let's go to the next level. So we are in Inception here. So she freaks out and slams the door on him because she gets scared. And then it cuts away to Ben. What the heck just happened? He hears something that sounds like a music box. Yeah, so that's Pudsy's Christmas, and it's coming from one of these stuffed animals. And he squeezes it, and it starts playing it again. And as we see on the foot of this stuffed animal, it says RSM Fertility. All right, so when we go to look it up, we have this come up in Web Results, New York's Choice for the Best Fertility Care. Holy crap, we've been seeing this all season! Finally! Oh my god.
This has been in David's visions, and we've been trying to figure out what the heck it means. Well, this is a nice payoff, I gotta tell you. Next, we're taken back to a scene at the house. We see Alexis sleeping on the floor, Kristen coming in to find her there. Alexis tells Kristen she wanted to wait up for her, but meanwhile, we see there's a package over here. Alexis tells Kristen she doesn't know where it came from, and there's a note, I'm sorry, step number nine, Orson. So Kristen takes the basket, puts it back outside, tells Alexis to go back up to bed and go to sleep. She doesn't tell Alexis where she's going, but she says she'll be stepping out and she will be right back. So my interpretation of all of this is that Orson actually appeared as the demon goat man. Logistically, that's the only thing that seems to make sense because she did open the door for somebody. Now she could have been sleepwalking and imagining this, but it is odd that she's seeing the same creature that the others are seeing. So Kristen isn't messing around. Now we do know Kristen has a temper, okay? Because she has cut Leland. Like she just cut him without any hesitation. And we saw her go off on Leland in last week's episode and she seemed to really, really enjoy completely berating and humiliating Leland the way she did. What I find so shocking here is as normal and put together as she seems, you really never know what's going on in someone's head. Like they could bludgeon someone to death. That's really terrifying. But she does hesitate for a second. You can tell she's thinking about it but she probably feels she's justified to protect her family. Meanwhile, David and Bed go to visit this RSM fertility clinic. Okay, so this is another piece of a puzzle, and I'm not talking about like the puzzle pieces that flash on the screen. Chicago, New York, and Washington, DC. These are the locations. And David has a realization here. The three stars that have been in David's vision all of a sudden make sense. And they all line up. Look, we have New York, Chicago, and Washington, DC. This is not a coincidence. It's all coming together, guys. It's all coming together. So Ben asks about some of the mothers who have used their services. And we have a bunch of babies here. Now let's take a look. It's Eric. Eric, the boy that tried to kill his sister. The way everything starts to come together here is just like, oh my god. I don't know about these other babies. I wonder if there's some other significance to them or they're just there. I might be missing something. Let me know if I am. Wow, I was not expecting that. And you know who else used them? Bridget and Dwight Farrell. Dwight, the man that's not only in jail for murdering several children, but is also taking the rap for all of Orson's murders. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while the man slept, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So the slaughter of the innocents isn't killing babies, it's actually corrupting the egg. Then David gets a call that Eleanor's water broke. We're taken to a scene in the hospital. We learn from Dr. Boz that Eleanor is in labor, but they did not get a chance to complete their exorcism. And then Ben notices that Kristen has blood on her leg. Oh, and it's definitely there. When he asks her why does she have blood on her leg, she says she doesn't have blood on her leg. See? Kristen says her family is safe and she is spectacular. So the supposed demon baby is born. Ben points out that it doesn't look like a demon baby, but then again, what does the devil look like? So the two of them tell Kristen about the clinic and how they believe that the clinic is trying to corrupt these babies before they're born and that the psychopaths are trying to corrupt the eggs so that they can turn them into more psychopaths. But when they tell her the name of the fertility clinic, there is a very scary aha moment here. We learn that Lexus was born using in vitro at that clinic. Kristen goes home and pulls out her files. As you can see, there's her file on Alexis and there's the name of the clinic with the logo. She hears a knock on the door and it's Cheryl. Cheryl tells Kristen that Leland and her are getting married and she wants her to be happy for them. Cheryl begs Kristen to accept them and to put aside her differences with Leland, but Kristen just slams the door in her face. We're taken to a scene of David praying next to his bed. For a second, it looks like David is gonna use his magic mushrooms to take him on a journey to talk to God, but it turns out they are not needed. David doesn't see God, he sees himself in the musical Oklahoma. Just kidding. So we see David out in a field. When David turns around, who do we see? Our friend, the demon horny goat man. And he is in the fields reaping what he sows. David sees Kristen, but it's like he's invisible. She walks by him as if he's not even there. And she's just going right to the demon goat. Cut back to the house. We have Kristen checking in on the girl. Of course, knowing what we learned now, this puts a big question mark on Alexis. Was she corrupted in any way? As far as we could see, she has shown no signs of a psychopath. But if you remember, it was Alexis that took the rock and hit the girl over her head. Maybe Leland is aware of all of this. Kristen then gets the call from Mira saying that Orson was bludgeoned to death. I thought at this point, maybe she was going to pull out the weapon and that it would be revealed that she was responsible for him. And as we reviewed in the beginning of the video, this crucifix burned her, which is not a good sign. Beautiful ending right there. And that is the last shot that we see of Kristen before next season. I think there's a couple ethical issues that are coming up here beyond Kristen being possessed. How far would a woman go to protect her family? Because remember, in Rose 390, 
When the mom said, you gotta do what you gotta do to protect your family sometimes, it was heavily implied that they killed Eric, their son, to protect the rest of their family. And now, thinking back on that, I wonder if that was foreshadowing. If she did kill Orson, was she possessed at the time she did it? Or was that her, on her own, just protecting her family from a serial killer? And if she is possessed, as the crucifix would indicate, how long has she been possessed? Has she been possessed the whole season? I think back to when that cat was growling at her. Maybe the cat knew. Like, maybe that was a hint even back then. So we did get a lot of payoffs in this episode, but we also have a lot of questions that we still don't know the answers to. Please leave a comment below. I will try to respond. If you're not part of our Facebook group, I'll leave a link down in our description. You can join us. So it looks like there's a lot of different directions they can go in with season two and I'm looking forward to it. If you have watched all of my recaps and joined me because of them, thank you so much for watching them. I have other shows that I'm recapping too, so please check those out, and I will definitely be back here to review everything from season two, and I will additionally be making a puzzle video. Also, there are a bunch of new shows starting out probably in the next week and months that I'm probably gonna be recapping, so if you wanna check those out, you're welcome to do that. Thanks again for watching, you guys. I will see you in my next video.